Hey, what's going on? Welcome to Angular Air. I am your host, Justin Schwarzenberger, and we've got another episode for you. Today, we are going to be talking about facades and the facade pattern. I am your host, Justin Schwarzenberger. And uh -oh. Sorry, that was me. I'm really Today, sorry. We are going to be <laughs> that double play. Do I have to mute, Bonnie? All right. So, hey, sounded like my delivery was pretty good, so I'm going to go with that. And that's, that's, that's good. Sounded good. So. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's uh, let's meet our panelists, and then we'll say hi to our guests, and then get into this whole facade discussion. So, joining us today, we've got Bonnie. What's going on, Bonnie? I'm so excited! I'm so excited! You got us the best guest today, Justin, and I'm very excited about it. Awesome! And Mike is with us. Mike, what's going on? Hi. Let's get started. <laughs> I'm excited as well. All right, let's get started. Uh, Thomas Burleson, how's it going, Thomas? Hey there, Shorty. Hey, everybody. I swear, I thought you were having a schizophrenic moment there when Bonnie's recording started going. I'm so sorry. Yeah, you, you were having, I was freaking out. I'm like, where's that? Why? why I, I thought it was coming from you, right? I thought you were mumbling another time or something. Like, are you guys oh, hearing this? Fucking yeah. doesn't mute me. All right. So we got, the, we got that all clarified, right? So we're good. Yeah. How's it going, Thomas? Really good, very good. Uh, got back from NGConf and we did a little mountain biking, about seven or eight of us. And um, I realized the altitude is a butt kicker out there, just not used to it. But you know, I persevered and didn't break anything. So life is good. All right, that's that's awesome. I mean, important that you don't break the important things, right? Like your hands and your fingers, right? Because you need to put, and then your brain, but yeah. Right? Well, I've been told that little pebble of a brain is rock hard. Nothing can break that thing. All right, still wore a helmet though, right? Always, always. All right. yeah. Cool, cool. Uh, speaking of Angie Comp, uh, did you talk a little bit about this facade stuff while you were there? I did, and in fact, um, it's funny. You know, these days in the community, whether you're in the Angular community or in the TypeScript community or whatever, reactive programming in RxJS is big, right? Um, and we're hearing a lot more about uh, facades and NGRX and all that. And I love NGRX. Uh, but I think this talk, you guys are going to hear me talk not so much about facades, which is a mechanism to achieve this, but you're going to hear me really be talking about push-based architectures and why that's so important. So that's why I'm excited. Well, we because it's a little bit about the facade, right? Well, the facade, like I said, is a mechanism to, that helps you do that easily. Yeah. Uh, but if you don't understand the whole idea of push based and why that's so good, then sometimes the magic of the facade isn't so magical. That's one thing I really liked about your talk is that it was almost like the marketing side of it, not so much the how you do things, but more so the why. And I really liked your explanations, your visuals, and everything else. So I'm looking forward to seeing, uh, I'm assuming we're going to see a few things similar to what we saw that's before right. uh, to be able to explain and understand that pattern, not just. Oh, how do I do this? But more so the why. You like my visuals? Because right after this talk, Alad Bezalel came up to me and goes, your visuals sucked. <laughs> now, he was being nice because, you know, I've known him forever, right? But And he could do a much better job. But it was, it was like, my response was, you're right, they suck. Can you help me make them better? I, I mean, I would argue with him because your visuals, like that was one of the original things from, that's what made you a good teacher from a long time ago, right? Like Samantha comes around now and says, we need visuals because she's, I don't know, if you guys know Samantha, we're not going to go on that tangent, but like you were, the fact that you use visuals like really all through your teaching material, I think is really important. It doesn't matter if they're flashy, but I mean, it's a, it's really important. It's an important aspect of teaching that I think is under underappreciated. Well, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll be the first to admit, I'm mostly a developer with some design talent, but I'm not a designer with developer talent. So when you get really good designers, and a lot is both a great designer and a great developer, he's allowed to say your graphics suck because he's a great designer. Yeah, well, that's fair. This is true. But I still think that like the most important part when you were teaching is to deliver the concept and, and have that resonate with people, right? And so if your graphics were able to do that, which I believe that they did, I, I for one, liked them and thought they conveyed the point really well. Um, and so that, you know. We said. <laughs> right, right. right. I was, well, you know, I, yeah, I was like, think about it, like if you're selling something, right, and you're trying to hook people into buying something, then yeah, right. like that, you want to have that flashy look, right? But if you're trying to teach somebody, it's whatever resonates with them to drive that point That's home, right. right? 
Well, it's sort of, it goes all the way back to the fundamentals of why is RxJS so important? And it's, people get lost in the mechanics of how do you use an observable, how to create one, and what about uh, operators? And they forget, why are they supposed to be using them? What, why? And then they, they go, oh, well, I could use async and await, or I can use promises. And then at that point, you realize they've missed the point, right? Because th those are powerful tools, but they don't solve that central critical problem, which is data pushing. Right. Yeah. And, and under, like you said, understanding what it is you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And then those are the tools to help you do that. And then you understand a lot better, I think, how those tools can be used and right. what the cost and benefit and plus like that sort of thing. And the facade pattern, I think, falls into that same sort of thing. And we're talking about design patterns. Uh, they're, they're designed, that's a bad use of that word, uh, to provide these solutions for these concepts, right? That then you could apply in these different realms to, to do things that these patterns that were are common, right? And the whole gang of four. Right. Like that. Well, let, so let's talk about that for a minute because we have this idea of um, most developers, they write code pull-based. And so they, Wait, they build their- Stop you guys for a second because I know I'm, I'm gonna speak for all of the beginners out there because I've done this before, right? You guys are highly, highly intelligent. And Thomas, I know we've had lots of conversations. I have so much admiration for your experience, but there's so many beginners. Before you jump into that, can you just talk for just a quick second, what the hell is a design pattern? Because it's an important part of the conversation. And I, I like we as architects would assume that everybody knows what a design pattern is, but I didn't even know a design pattern existed until I became an architect. So for all okay. of, a lot of developers who watch this who are not architects, what is a design pattern? So a design pattern is essentially a, a approach that you take to structure your code to solve a particular problem. And that, that approach that you take, there are recognized patterns of how to organize your code that uh, scale in terms of complexity or make things simpler to, to reduce what we call coupling of how components connect to each other, how they are dependent upon each other. And so there's there's things called like the event delegation pattern, the observer pattern, the, fa the facade isn't, the, the facade pattern is another one. So let me talk about this, the facade pattern um, as- Can I say this real quick? You know, when, when I'm sorry, Thomas. When we talk about um, when we talk about uh, standing on the shoulders of giants, right? That people like you and Ward Bell and, and some of the people who have been doing Angular for a really long time, like the architects, have done everything wrong and made all these mistakes and done all these edge cases and basically get this code. Like you take all of that experience and distill it into a design pattern, and that's to me that's the value. Like. All of this stuff is like, once you've been doing this for 10 years and you know how to do this, and I think when I was a younger developer, I didn't really grasp some of these concepts. And so I just want to tie that in and I'm going to shut up now because I'm sorry. I think no worries. To clarify though, um, with the idea of the design patterns, and I, I agree giving credit where credit is due, uh, as people like Thomas and Ward and what have you, but it predates all Absolutely. Of this, right. I mean, these things go back 40 years, these concepts, Absolutely. these recognized patterns, and they're well documented. Um, and you can go and look a lot of them up. Um, and yes, the facade pattern is one of those design patterns. But before you start talking about the facade pattern, um, I think it would be really prudent to talk about the concepts of push and pull uh, and explain what those are and start use that as our starting point. And then we can sprinkle in or you can sprinkle in things like the uh, facade pattern on top of that. Sure. Not to spend I think those core concepts is uh, really what's at play here. I think because I think it's such a valuable conversation and obviously the architects already know all of this, right? But it's such a valuable conversation that if we just take a minute, all the beginners can follow along with us. And I think that's so valuable because sometimes it's not actually, we're not going to maybe dive into a code demo, but it's this helicopter view that's architecture that's so important. So let's all the way, let's back all the way up to basics, right? So if we're writing an Angular application, and we're struggling on how to, to, to um, use Angular properly and how to build an application, we immediately come into this idea of, of a view component. And a view component has an HTML template and it has some data binding that you can use to data bind uh, the, um, DOM structures in your HTML template to your logic code that's in the component itself or in other places, right? Actually, you bind to the, to the public properties in the component itself. So, 
you initially, you start writing HTML in your template and you start writing some code. And then you say, well, I can use um, HTTP service and I can use dependency injection and I can inject that service in. And now I'll make a call to, um, to a remote server to load a list of users. Let's say something like that, okay? And you get the response back from the server. And then you say, oh, it's a JSON object. And now I'm going to save that array of users. And then I'll use an ng4 and I'll loop over and I'll show a list of users in my UI. OK, that's cool. Uh, that's, the, that's your sort of initial starting point that everyone uh, codes from. The thing is, and that's what we call a pull based. When you want the data, you request it. You make a request through a service and you pull the data to the view. So the view is pulling the data to itself from someplace else. So as your application gets more and more complicated, then um, you might have multiple services that you're injecting into different views. You might have data that you want to share between different views. And things start getting really complicated. And they get scary. Because all of a sudden, you start thinking about, now everyone's pulling. And everyone's, and then if you want to share the data, what, how, do, how do you know if someone pulled a refresh set of data and it's stored in a service, how do the other views know that that data is now updated and they should re-render? They don't unless you do something even more complicated, right? Because they're all still have, so when you have pull-based services or pull-based views, that means that the view either to know the data's changed either has to pull or has to submit a callback to be, so then the callback says, hey, view, please re-query. Please re, you know, make another request to get the refresh data. Some sort of mechanism, right? There's all, there's all these different approaches. And um, the fundamental paradigm change that we're at right now is that with RxJS, we can invert that logic because really good Angular applications have super simple view layers. I mean, they, they render very complicated UI user experiences, but there's hardly no code in the view layers. That doesn't mean the code's gone. It just means it's in the non-view layers. So it could be in the business layers or the data service layers. And those are all very, very testable, right? And then you can just focus on, um, I have I want to do this layout, and I want it to look this way and be styled this way. And here's the data. And I don't care where it comes from, right? If that's the goal, then the question becomes, well, how do you get the data? Because if you're still pulling it, or if you have a service that's still pulling it, then you're still doing it what I call the wrong way. Because what we want to do is we want to invert our thinking to say, what if we could create our views or even our services where we have a pipeline to some other data provider that pushes us data whenever it's changed or whenever it's available? And then when I, the service or the view that's waiting for the data to be pushed to me, gets that data, then I can react to that new set of data. And if I'm a view, then I can re-render. And that's an incredibly powerful concept, right? I mean, I've been working with RxJS now for three or four years. And before that, I was doing a lot of work with promises, um, some little bit of work with async and await, and a lot of work with event listeners. So with event listeners, we struggled through tons of pain, you know, nesting callback hells and memory leaks and all these other things. And that's the first thing we learned. And then we, we realized, well, wait a minute, we can use promises, right? We can, that reduces the nesting structure, the nesting pyra the pyramid of, of, of hell. The problem with promises is again, it's still pull-based. When you create a promise, it's essentially making a request. And when the data is available, then you get it. So you're pulling the data out. So the great, beautiful thing about RxJS is that this concept of a stream is not just a short one-time request only thing. It could be a one-time data push, but often you, we want developers to think of the following. Streams are permanent connections to a data source that whenever that data source or provider changes, whenever that producer is going to reproduce new data, it's automatically going to be pushed to whoever's listening. And that's the fundamental difference between a pull-based solution application and a push-based application. With push-based, we want our views to just wait there and idle. And then when the data comes in, it's just going to fire change detection, and the template will re-render, or all the templates will re-render. Extremely high performant and super easy high-level concept. And, and to be clear, you this idea of having a push-based component really is 
in my opinion, independent of the idea of RxJS as well. Sure, it helps as the tool that you use to be able to do that. But if you have what's commonly referred to as a DOM or presentation component, and all you're doing is receiving your data through inputs and exposing events through outputs with no other data retrieval, you're still push based because the only way you're getting data is if data is pushed to you through the input. So it's Yes, I understand the concept of having RxJS to be able to attach and get data multiple times, but from an individual component standpoint, it doesn't necessarily have to utilize RxJS. It can just get its value push base through inputs. That's a really valid point, and it's something I often forget about. These are what we call presentation components, right? They don't know they don't have injected services. They get their data from the parent. It's usually from the parent on the template, right, or a parent parent, but it's in the template structure. It comes in. And often they delegate events out. They say, hey, the user clicked on this button. Maybe the button is, is a back button. So they say the, the event going out is back. They don't know who's going to do what with that event, right? They're just emitting the event. And then when the data comes in through an input, they're rendering. So totally correct. Presentation components via the inputs are another form of um, push-based architecture. However, when I tend to talk about systems that are push-based, it's not just the views. It's in, it's just it's um, data models that that are. Uh, we'll get into this in a minute where we talk about this idea of immutability, and um, it's this idea of of services, right? So where does a facade come into play then? So a facade is a pattern that just basically says, listen. Uh, you could reduce it. I, I like to paraphrase things, right? So I'm not going to be technically correct here. I could look it up in the Gang of Four, and then everyone would fall asleep. It's a great book for a, uh, a sedative, right? And who needs antihistamines when you can read the Gang of Four? But it is a great reference man manual. So a facade. What is a facade? A facade is a, an approach to structuring your code that hides the complexity of other code. It gives you a specific set of API that you're allowed to use. It could be properties. It could be methods that you use, but you don't know how it actually does the work internally. You don't know how many other services it uses internally. You don't know where the data comes from internally. Nothing. So from the perspective of the view, when they use a facade, it becomes super clean. The facade is designed for the data and the services that the views need. So hey, Tom. You'll, Yes? I don't want to keep interrupting you because I really I, I love this, but also I I know because I know uh, you have a visual for this, and maybe I'm jumping ahead, but it's such a good visual, and I could not understand what you were saying until I saw the visual the first time I learned this, and it's such a it's beautiful, and it really helped me a lot. Shall I? Sh uh, you want me to share some of those visuals from the uh, conference when we well, talk about it? I haven't. I didn't see that one, but I did. I know there's one that I know of from a long time ago when you taught me about facades originally. And while you're, and I wanna just jump in here real quick and say like one of the things, I really miss you, Thomas. I haven't seen you in a while. And I'm remembering while I'm sitting here watching you talk, what my original favorite thing about you was because you take these really advanced concepts that are actually very important, but you explain it. You just, it's so simple when you explain it. And also your visuals are good, but just taking these high level architectural concepts and making them so simple. And what you're saying about the push and the pull, like what I've learned over the past couple of years, especially since I became a GDE and I started hanging out with all these really cool architects, right? Is that the, the difference between beginner Angular people and really experienced Angular people is the really experienced Angular people don't write very much code. And the pattern that Thomas is talking about once you start think it's just basically kind of a way for you to think about it in your mind and once you make that switch in your mind and you start thinking about that all of a sudden your code is clean and beautiful and and this, I, I worked with thomas on a project a couple years ago and his code is like it's it's he's so good at this but it's so simple the code is so it's just beautiful i'm going to shut up and let you sorry <laughs> thank you bye <laughs> I, 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 I wanted to add one thing so you you keep on using this word facade and you say it's a way of abstracting what's behind it and the way i've always thought about that word is through two different means one is that it's basically a contract it's basically saying hey this is what i'm going to expose to you this is what i'm going to make public to you and the other way of thinking about contracts especially within code is through the idea of an interface and that's how I tend to think about what if thought is of you're defining, hey, this is what I'm going to expose. This is my API. This is my surface. And this is what you have to be able to work off of. 
Right. So in fun, it's funny that you mentioned this, uh, Mike, because someone on Twitter sent me a direct message the other day saying, should I call it a facade or a service? And my response was, if, it's a, if we call it a facade when it has a fixed API, the API is designed for the views, could be designed for other facades, but in general, it's for the views. And it's intended to provide uh, a clean access to data and very clean methods that the views can use. If it's a service, a service is one that often I think of as um, like a WebSocket service or an HTTP um, data service layer, these things. Those that are not, they're meant to be used generically, right? They're just sort of a set of APIs. But a facade is also, is one that's closer to the view. And in fact, you'll hear Ward Bell talk about this occasionally. He calls it a view model, right? That's from, from MVVC, MVVCM and MVVC. So, um, that's fast. So, and model view controller and model view, view model controller and things like that. So, but you notice I don't like those terms, right? I'd rather just reduce it to a simplest thing, which is you could think of a facade as an injected service. It's a singleton, usually, uh, that has an API, a specific set of properties. And the difference, though, with a push-based facade is that all the properties are observables. And all the methods will either return an observable or they will return a void. So they will never return raw data. Never, 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 never return raw data from a push-based facade. And I'll show, I'll show reasons why in just a minute, okay? And so, okay, so shall I show some pictures? Um, what do you think, uh, uh, Shorty? Should I share the screen and show some? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. And I really like, I want to call out, you, you called it a push-based facade. And I like that because it's taking, you know, it's the facade concept, but like you said, it's all observable. So categorizing it in, for me, like thinking about it as it's a push-based facade that I'm creating. That Correct. sums it up really well. That's very nice. Well, and where people get into... Brain, then for, it's not even so much an architectural pattern, it's for your brain to like think this way. That's correct, right? Because we can get lost in the syntactics, right? The, the, um, the, the, the language structures and all that. And we can think of code as being a beautiful thing also. However, I like the first thing you need to do is step back and think at a high level and go, what is it I'm trying to accomplish? Why do I want to use observables? Why are streams important? And I've only hinted a couple things and we'll, learn, we'll talk about more in just a minute. All right. So tell me when you're ready, Shorty. I'm set. So if you want to right. share your screen, then I'll present to everyone. That'll be perfect. OK, let's see here. Uh, I'm going to share this. Nope, this one. OK. Cool. And can All right. you bump the font up on the code? Well, I will, and in fact, let me do that in just, I will in just a minute, okay? Cool, perfect. So but I, I'm going to do this because I don't want everyone to get lost in the, um, in the in the code itself, I want them to focus. It's like it's like me saying, "Hey, focus on my eyes," <laughs> but you guys can't see my eyes now, right? So, right. So here's what training with Thomas. He's hilarious because he's very bossy. <laughs> I'm not bossy. I you no, know what? Uh, my, I say it in such a good way, though. Well, what I what I tell and I've told this to you also, Bonnie. I said, you know, um, and I've told this to even my kids used to go, "Hey, you're being so you're being bossy." It's like, no, I'm just being passionate. Yeah, it's sort of like the difference between someone who is someone. So, why are you yelling at me? And I'll say, I'm not yelling at you. I'm just yelling. Oh, that you're yelling, and I'm you're standing right next to me while I'm yelling, but I'm not yelling at you. But Thomas, I, I use that same line with my parents when I grew up. I'm like, I'm not mad. I'm not yelling. I'm not arguing. I'm just uh -huh. passionate. I'm just passionate, right? right? And I love passionate, right? We're all passionate here. But Mike Rocky tends to be more passionate internally unless he sees you, and then he gives you a big hug, and then that passion comes out, which sounds weird, but I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> I'm fine with that. <laughs> I Thanks love so much, you. You're definitely getting a hug. I love it. Okay, so here is just a little graph, uh, a visual to talk about sort of the traditional pull based. And I started this conference off, at, uh, this presentation off at, at NGConf, and the, the main slide said, the way you've been coding is all wrong, right? And it was meant to be provocative. And it was meant to actually have someone not get angry, but step back and go, well, what do you mean? 
And this is what I'm, I mean here is, so when you're doing, you're approaching and you're coding, and we're going to ignore for a minute Mike's, um, also his input about, pardon the pun, about view component inputs, because that's push based, but I don't want to distract uh, developers from the overall concept, right? We can we swing back to that in a minute. So a pull based is just a service that you can you're going to call to get some data from, or you're going to call, and maybe you won't even get the data synchronously. Maybe it will do something asynchronously, but if it does something asynchronously, how does it give you the data that you've requested? Well, typically we do that through um, a callback. Right, here's, you give me a callback, here's the data, or we'll do it through a promise, right? So a promise is a mechanism to deliver data to a consumer asynchronously. Promises always deliver data asynchronously, in fact. So, but the interesting thing is that um, a poll-based approach doesn't even have to be anything about promises. Look what I, we have here. Can you guys see my cursor? Yeah. Notice this method, find all users. Notice I didn't say what data is coming back. Right, so find all users. I'm making a method call. I'm pulling. I'm making a call to pull some data out. Now, um, how does it get the data back to view one and view two? Well, that's there's various approaches, uh, and, and that's not something I really want to go into because what I really want to go into is to say, well, if you make a pull thing, how do the views know when the data has been updated? Remember me saying that a minute ago. Right, so that, that's a big problem. If the, if you just have data in one view, then maybe you don't need to share about it to share it. And maybe you don't care if it's refreshing on the server. So, you know, when the user hits a refresh button, maybe you'll manually refresh. But for a lot of people, there's this issue of, of applications, I mean, that the multiple views, they need to know when the data has changed. And that's actually one of the biggest problems in non-trivial Angular applications is the views are using data and they struggle with, well, who's changing my data? W where is it changing? How do I get notified that it's been changed? And um, this is where NGRX and Redux sort of became very popular. And NGRX is extremely great, uh, uh, let's call it a library, let's call it, a, it's a set of patterns, I love it. But for many cases, you may not need it. All right, so, so if, what I'd like to say is if you're building Angular applications and you're doing pull-based approaches, in general, you're doing it wrong. Like now, when I actually write applications and I write view code, I'm always thinking about having facades or services that are push-based, always. Because if I think of it always as being push-based, then I can write my views to be passive and just react to the data that comes in. And I'll show some really cool tricks that um, that I, I one especially that I learned about recently that I like a lot that was so obvious that I can't believe I didn't see it myself earlier. Uh, and now it's like, oh, you know, like what I should have had a V8 or is that the commercial, you know, or a Mentos commercial or something. All right. So here is this idea of a push base service. Now we have view one and view two. These views may use, they may show a list of users. They may show a set of search, in this case, some search criteria. They may even show pagination information, right? Because we don't want to show a million users. We may want to show 20 users per page and what page are we on and things like that. So with a push-based um, uh, approach, notice that these are now streams because an observable stream in this case, is a permanent, long-lived stream. Now, if you route away from one view that's using streams, then of course you need to disconnect from uh, your subscription to that stream because you're no longer listening to it, right? That view is going to be destroyed and you want to disconnect. That's true. Um, if though you're not routing away or um, let's, re regardless, these streams will stay in play and, and be available for anyone who wants to use them. They're always there, they're permanent. So notice now I have, I've called it a user facade. I didn't call it a, um, a service because again, I like to think of my services being as HTTP APIs, HTTP REST service APIs, WebSocket APIs, other things. This facade is, you could think of it as I subtitled called user view model. So it's, it's a view model or a user facade for views that are trying to deal or show data that deal with users, okay? So why do we want our data to be, our views to be passive? 
Well, if we used the change detection of um, strategy of on push, and we're using streams, and we're using the async pipe, then we have an extremely performant view that will only re-render when data is comes again through the stream, when refresh data comes through the stream. And that's a very powerful concept, right? Because now we, we're writing passive views, but we're writing smart passive views. They know when to render, and they don't re-render when the entire application re-renders. They, excuse me, when all the views of change detection fires at the application and goes down the tree, the change detection tree, they only re-render when the data that the views are interested in are the, is pushed to them again. And that push now comes from two places. Mike, you mentioned inputs. Obviously, on the on push strategy is was originally intended for um, inputs, right? Data coming in from the parent. But if you have a, a facade injected in for the constructor, then the data could come in from the facade streams. And using the async pipe, we again trigger on the same thing. We mark for change detection when the data is pushed and we're good to go. So the other thing I like to say is with NGRX that while I love it, um, even with NGRX, I use facades, right? Uh, however, so many people get um, lost in the details of NGRX and the issues of when do you need to use it, when you don't, what should you use? Should you use raw NGRX? Should you use at NGRX entity? Now there's another one called at NGRX data. Which one do you use? And how do you structure your effects and all that? And that gets that can get very complicated. And the solutions with NGX are pretty amazing, but for most, many developers, it's too much, right? It's, it's certainly cognitive overload in the beginning. So how do they approach the idea of push-based um, facades and push-based services? So let's take a look at um, this example here. So I have this UI here, and I'm in fact just going to show this because I think it's pretty cool to show it. All right, let's, can you, does this, let me increase the font size. Is that better? Yes. Yes. Okay. So what we have here is we have just one app component, right? And it's showing. Hey, Thomas, uh, I think we might even go up one more just because we have some people who watch on mobile. Sorry. How about that? That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. So here we're doing an NGF to say, we're not going to show this page. Um, this entire page here if we don't have pagination data available, all right? Notice this isn't streams. This is the approach many developers will take, okay? So what I'm showing first is a pull-based approach, and then we'll talk about some of the problems with it. So this, this approach has problems both in data management or state management and with actual, it, it also with user experience. It's really weird. But it's true, your architecture will affect the user experience. And, and I'll, I'll demonstrate that in just a minute, OK? So here we have a pagination. We have an input control that's using a form control to say, hey, I, I want to have a search term, right? So the input control is where I'm going to search for um, uh, 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 users of a certain, uh, with a certain name, a partial name. And what I'm using here is a form control that will bridge between the native DOM control and whatever code that I want to call that will, that will actually um, uh, run the search for the users. And then I have this code here that has some pagination information. So, like, uh, so let's just show it here. All right, let's do this here. All right, so here are my pagination uh, search page size, so I can change this. I could change the search. Um, I can load users, and I can show the page size. So notice, if I change here, nothing happens, right? This is the traditional approach. So I, I've changed an option, but now I have to, I've changed it, but now I have to remember to call load users. So when I click load users, if I look down here, load users right here, that's this button here, is going to call this method here. So if I come over to this guy, here is my load users. So this is just saying I'm going to use this um, HTTP service. It's called a facade. Um, I call it a facade because it also has some data properties. But this isn't a push-based facade. This is a pull-based facade, right? This is the bad way to do it. So uh, 
and I'll, I'll show the details of that in just a moment. Well, actually, let's just do it now. So here's our facade. Let's do this. So notice it's got some data. I'm managing a, a set of data. So here's my users. Here's my search criteria. Here's my pagination information, selected size, current page, page sizes that are available. I have a find all users. I'm injecting the HTTP client in. The find all users builds the endpoint URL and makes the request with that URL. Hey, go ahead and get this um, at this endpoint, this REST API endpoint. And then when I get the results back, show it here. So I have this list here. What? And by the way, you'll notice you could say, well, Thomas, this is a stream. Isn't that a push-based service if this is a stream here? And it's not because guess what? I am I'm building this on the fly. I'm using it, I extract the data out, and then I don't care about it anymore. And every time I call find users, I'm building a new stream. So that's still a poll-based approach, right? I'm making a call, and then to get the data to, that will come in later, I have a stream that will deliver it to me, that will push the data to me, but it was based on my poll request. And so that's, that's the fundamental issue here, is it's still poll-based. I have some methods that will update pagination, and, and uh, here's another one, build the user URL. So you guys may ask, well, um, you know, what, Thomas, why are you storing this data here? You guys, one of you want to ask that? Why would you do that, Thomas? <laughs> why do you have <laughs> Yeah, great questions, guys. <laughs> so I, I'm doing it now to make a point, which is um, what if I had my user facade that was being um, that that was being used by multiple views. Right now, I only have one view component. It's the app component, right? So it's injected the facade here. Um, but the data, I could have stored the data up in, up in here, but then you'd be missing the point because what we're really talking about is not just a push-based architecture, but also about managing changes to your data. Right. And you don't care if there's changes to your data that are if it, the data is in your view. But when it's outside of one view and it's being shared or reused, that's a huge problem. This so, is um, can I add something real quick to that? Sure. Uh, managing data in or, or changes to your data in your application, right? Versus changes to the data that you're persisting to the back end. That's correct. Right. So, yes, absolutely, mm -hmm. Shorty. This is changes to the data in memory. This is not. Mm -hmm persistent changes, this is in memory. This is perfect, Thomas, because there's a, a guy in the chat, Constantine, as soon as you started showing us this pattern, he said, how do you manage your changes? And you're like, I'm gonna show you how to manage your changes. So this is for you, Constantine. Cool. So in fact, when we start talking about push-based architectures, a lot of people will see the title and they'll go, wait a minute, I don't really care about how you're pushing data from the server. Well, guess what, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about push-based architectures in the client tier, only in the application layer, right? That's pretty, that's a fundamental paradigm shift because you could still have, um, you could have web sockets that connect to the server or to the middle tier that push data to you also, but now you need a way to get the data that's been pushed to the, to the application itself and have it pushed somehow to the views that are interested in it. And that's what we're talking about. So go ahead. Real quick, so to be clear, what, part of what makes this push-based, excuse me, pull-based is, <laughs> sorry, two different P words. We needed different words <laughs> that are autistically, or auto, audibly different. Um, but part of what the end goal is to, is to be able to get to the point where we can turn on change detection on push, right? Yes, and in fact, we even have that um, here. We're, we're, this is still poll based, and we still are using uh, on push. Okay. So um, that's that's what we're getting. But since you're getting a different observable every time you make that service call to get all users, that's don't right. You then manually have to set the change detection because you are having a new value return internally inside of this component. Right. So let's take a look at the template there for a moment. So here is our um, list of users. So whenever this stream comes is available, whenever it comes in, async pipe essentially subscribes to it and will extract the data out when the data has been pushed through that stream and will represent that data as a variable here in the template called users. Okay, that's cool. 
If I rebuild user stream later with another call, the async pipe says I've already subscribed to an old one. It's going to unsubscribe from the old one and resubscribe to the new reference. So the async pipe is incredibly powerful. Uh, and that's why you'll notice I said it was not just using push-based architectures, but it's also using um, on push and the async pipe. Those three are what make the view layers incredibly powerful, right? So, uh, but I can't stress enough that while I'm using streams here and while I'm making a call to some service or some facade, find all users returns a stream. While I'm doing that, it's still pull based, right? I, I'm, I'm making a request and I can prove it in the UI. So here's how I said your architecture affects your UI. Now I added some code here. Let me, uh, I'll introduce this just for a moment so we can just watch this. Let's change this to five. So I added some code in my, in my view that said, hey, when this, value changes, clear the list, okay? Because I wanted users to know that um, when they see this demo, that the, the data has changed, but I have a new call to load users. Typically, this tells a lot, right? Typically, we load users, and tell me it's, it's gonna work. There we go. We load users, and if I change the structure, and I did extra code to, to actually clear out the, the um, uh, let's go here. So when I change the pagination size right here, notice I set users dollar to null. I manually set that stream to null. That's a hack. That's a hack because I'm using a pull based service, right? Every time I change this, I have to remember now to reload new users. Whenever I change this, I have to reload users based on my current search criteria. And I have seen, I know you guys have seen this too. We've seen this so many times where developers create pull-based services and they run into these scenarios where the data's changed, but the results haven't refreshed. One of the biggest challenges I think with that too is that then it just leads to us as developers trying to solve micro things, right? Like now you got to fix that scenario. Well, so you got to fix the pag pagination. You got to fix, fix the search term. And now all of a sudden you've got all this complex code handling all these different combos of scenarios. And That's you got to right. keep track of all that logic, make sure it doesn't break, make sure it's remains in, in its integrity as, as you make changes and stuff like that. It's, it's real challenging, right? Absolutely. Now, one thing I wanted to point out here is notice I have, I'm showing the current page size. If I change this, it does update, right? It does show me this. Let's take a look at how I'm achieving that because I have this um, update page size here. So I make a call to update pagination with the current page size. And then look what I'm doing. I'm re-pulling the current pagination out, right? So this is an inter in my facade here. I wish I could. Okay, here's this one. In my facade, I have all this data. Here's my pagination. When I call update pagination, I'm building a whole new object, right? So the, one of the ways that on push works is it looks at, does an explicit comparison. If the reference to the data itself, if it's a new data object, then on push triggers. But if you mutate the insides of the data and you're using on push, your view will not re-render because you modified the internals and on push and doesn't look at the internals. It just looks at the outside. And so, um, so the, the expectation when we, when you hear the term immutable data is that if you are going to modify the data, create a whole new object, regardless how deep it is, right? Whatever level that you, that you've created, you made modifications all the way up to the parent outside level of that object has to be a new object. That's how, um, immutable data is maintained. And that's one of the principles of Redux and NGRX. So I tried to do that here. I tried to say, okay, if you want to set the new selected size, which is here, I'm going to create a new pagination object by copying. I'm going to clone all the key value pairs over. This is called the spread operator. So I'm just going to clone all the key value pairs over and clone the pagination object. And then I'm going to overwrite the property selected size with the new selected size that just came in. That's cool. And I can even log saying I've updated it, right? So if I look here, you can see I've, uh, let's do it here. Oh, I'm updated, I have updated it. But how does this know that it's changed? Because it's still pull-based. If I go back to the component, you can see I cheated. I did this, 
right? I made a change of the service to the facade, and then I asked the facade with another pull request, hey, I want to read your property. That's a hack, right? I mean, that's classic things you do with pull-based. But this is the stuff you don't want to do, right? These are the things we want to get away from. We certainly want to get away from this idea that if, if um, here, let's close this, if I change the page size, then I shouldn't have to manually reload users, right? Smart applications anticipate what the user's doing and then will um, give them a user experience that feels smooth and seamless. And with a push-based architecture, then you're going to see that the new version with push-based, it just feels like you want to use it. All right, let me go back to the slides just for a moment. Not that one. Must be that one. Okay. So here I've, I've defined, and notice, um, Mike, you mentioned something about interfaces, right? So, I did. So often we'll use interfaces for, uh, and you know, there's TypeScript debates on should we use a type or an interface? Um, and we have APIs that will have their own set of interfaces. It's not necessarily this interface. So if we look at this pull-based approach, what's the interface? What's the API for this service? Well, it has three properties, users, criteria, and pagination, and they're all public raw values, right? And then, so when I got a new set of users, not only did I pipe this through the stream to the view, but notice I use the tap to actually then update my internal list. But what if, here's the biggest problem, what if we have a view one makes a call to find all users? It gets the user data. View two is list, watching this property here. I update users. They're never going to, view two is never going to know that the user's list is updated, right? Because I just updated a raw object. It's going to have to re-query just like we did um, here, where we re-queried for pagination. Same exact problem. I'm getting confused on my drop downs. Uh, so that's one problem. The other one is, uh, so I, the other problem here is that while this is raw data, I have methods that are returning asynchronous values. Right? They're, this one's returning an observable. So that means I could have returned a promise, right? So, I mean, that's irrelevant. Uh, but that means this is asynchronous. That means this data is potentially out of sync with the response that's going to be coming back in later. Right, so there's there's all sorts of weirdness to the this API that you could get in trouble with. So the API has three public properties, raw um, properties, and it has one public method, find all users. That's the API for the facade. Remember, I said that if we're doing a push-based facade, everything is observables. Never, 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 never use raw data. You did, there was one exception to that rule, which uh, your function there uh, define or uh, violates, is that um, the void is another return type. Yes, in fact, I even said that too. I said you could return observables and the methods or void. So I, way to keep me on my toes, absolutely. And by the way, I actually like this, right? If you because if I forget to say something. The, this may be some critical thought or comment that the uh, listeners would want to hear. So do this. Keep me on my toes. I love it. Oh, Shorty, you, you better jump in here, Shorty. Don't worry. We will. Bonnie, I know you're relentless. <laughs> I, just, I just typed in the chat, never, 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 never do this. Thomas Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I, I got to admit, I heard that from Carmen when she was talking about, um, I think it was machine learning. And she did that at one of the, uh, maybe it was Angular Connect. And she said, never, 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 never. And it totally stuck with me. Three years later, now I'm using it. All never, right. So never forget this, ever. Never, ever. <laughs> All right. So that is the pull based approach. Now let's talk about the push based approach, right? So there's tons of issues, right? These first, oh, then here's the other issue this data, users, criteria, and pagination, they're public, right? I didn't protect them with read only access. That means someone could write to them, oh, that's even worse. Oh my God, would that create problems? And I guarantee you, some developer on a team would do some crap like that, and I'd have to hand slap them. Like, I'm what were you thinking? Right now. <laughs> Are you talking about me? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> no, but I mean, uh, hey. Uh, 
really quick to illustrate that if in your component they they get the users and then they are uh, hand that user to another method somewhere and thinking like that's an isolated user object, but it's a Correct. reference to that object. That's how that can get changed and updated unintentionally, right? So the developer may do that not knowing they do that, but don't have that you know grasp of that immutability scenario right there. Oh, that's another good point. So not only I was referring to that they could just create a whole new array, you're referring to the point that they could mutate the array, which is even worse. So this is, by the way, what I meant when when uh, and you have a more than just a simple application, change management is a nightmare. Like you can go, this is one of the biggest problems with AngularJS applications was who the hell changed my data? Like, where's this, why is the change happening, right? Okay. So that's two parts. Actually, it's two phases. Who the hell changed my data? And how the hell do I know when the data has been changed? I'm using the hell word a lot here. I just replaced that with the F word, but I'm not using F bombs on the Angular Air, okay? I appreciate it. Don't forget 13 and not R. Come What's, on. Yeah. That's exactly how you feel, because he's wondering the same thing. Who the hell changed my data? <laughs> <laughs> well, but, well, I have, um, what was it? Um, I have a really good a picture. Uh, I have to find it. Uh, it's on one of my slide decks. It's called, um, it's your code review without NGRX or without RxJS. And it's a closed door. And you hear comments coming from behind the door. And it's WTF, WTF, what the hell, WTF. And then the next picture is your code reviews of your code when you're using RxJS properly. And then there's only one tiny little what? That's it, right? So this is true. Okay, so we have problems here, right? So pagination can change with, so you could even change the criteria in the pagination without changing users. Oh, that's even worse. Um, now, granted, here's another one, criteria and pagination. You have to assign those before you call find all users. So if you forget that, well, what if you wanted to pass them in? Well, now, but if you pass them in, that's even worse than having to assign them before. So all sorts of really weird problems can happen, right? And then this is the big one. If any of these things changes, how do the, all the views that are interested in that ch those changes get notified? And um, how do you share results, right? So these are these are real problems. All of these can be solved with a push-based approach. Push-based. Um, notice here, uh, Shorty, I said push-based user service. I'm going to be calling it actually user facade. So here we want to the confusion between those two words. A service is just the angular mechanism of which to provide a facade. Well, let's change that. Um, a service or a facade is an instance of some class that is not a view. That's dependency injected. That means Angular will create an instance of it. It could have, it could store your data. It could make calls to the server. It could, it could have an event bus in the background. It could be anything you want, um, and it's, but it's not a view component. So we tend to call these services, right? There's tons of services out there. A facade, though, is a specific is not only a service, but has a specific API that's been intended to be used at the view level, view layer. Can I it, can I say what how I remember facade when you taught this to me? Because I please. to a lot of other people. So um, and a lot of times, especially if you get into enterprise, you have junior developers, senior developers, architects, right? Um, and a lot of the business logic is in the service, as it should be. And to me, a facade is, is like, I mean, the word facade itself, right, is hide the complexity. So, and especially if you're using NGRX or state management, uh, if you have that kind of complex app. And I love NGRX, which is why I pick on those guys, right? But boilerplate, there's a lot of complexity and there's a lot of imports. And so for a, maybe a more senior architect to write all of this, you know, complicated stuff, and then you've got um, you know other team members who are who are really just doing all the presentation components and you know that kind of thing. So the facade, basically, if you if you can, when you have a facade, uh, you really like that would be that would handle all of your imports. So like like if you need five different services, you need all your you know state management, your actions reducers, all that kind of stuff, actions and effects. Then the facade would handle all of that for you. And when you get to your child component. You only import the facade if you're lucky. Is that right or is that wrong? I don't want to explain it wrong. No, that's right. Um, the, it. it hides the complexity behind a simple looking facade, a simple exterior, right? We often think of facades of houses. They have a certain look. You don't know what's inside the house. 
You don't know how many rooms are there. You don't know if it's a dump or if it's been built really well. It's the same with the service, right? But it, um, the facade is intended for some sort of connection, whether it's a visual in terms of code now, it's it has an API and it hides the complexity. I wanna add one more thing to that too. Yes. Uh, for anybody out there who's got the GraphQL bug, right, and experience and, and like that, it's similar to that, right? It's this concept of uh, something under the hood is doing a lot of stuff to collect all this stuff and then format it back in a package that in a way that you need it, right? And so this facade is, is a lot similar to like kind of that approach as well. And it's an important distinction for, for GraphQL and really for what Thomas is saying, the, the whole concept, what I, and I think, uh, what he, he's too modest, right? The the beauty of it is for two things, and and it it kind of took me a while to catch up with all this stuff when I started learning RxJS and, and NGRX. But the beauty of it is two things. Number one, the code in your final components uh, is much cleaner and smaller, but also you get a. I mean, you're it's faster. It's cleaner. It's faster. Period. That's it. Do what Thomas said. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we're getting a. Uh, Close to the top of the hour too, so we no! do we have do we have a hard stop? Uh, I've got like a hard stop of like fifteen minutes after the hour, so we got okay. like right, an extra All fifteen right, minutes. I, because let, me, let me rush through this because sometime soon. We're 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 um we're getting to the good part, so let me let me get through this because this is the important part. All right, so notice I when I create facades, I tend to visually th I always start with the API. Always, what is it that you want? What data? And I always start on the right side. What data do I want to provide out as, as streams? And then, based on that, what methods do I want that will modify the data internally? Right? Because this is not only a facade, you could think of it as uh, it manages data inside of itself. So, not only is using services inside and maybe talking to the remote server, but it's managing data that is fireboxed. You do not have direct access to that data ever. The only way you have access to the data is it through a stream when it gets pushed through that stream. And I found that when you when developers create facades, this approach, they don't even worry about the mechanics of it. They just design the API like this. It becomes super easy. And I have seen view code, Bonnie was talking about this view code, where there was all this business logic and use of streams and everything else and HTTP services, sometimes three to 500 lines of code in a view. And with the facade, it went down to 30 lines of code in the view and maybe 200 lines of code in the facade if you do it right. So an amazing refactoring you can do if you use facades right. However, to, a, to, to build your own facades, take this approach. Design the API mentally first. Okay, so now we have, and this is essentially, right, this is the same data we had before, users criteria and pagination, but look at this. Now I've said they're only available to the outside world via streams. And they're permanent streams, so they're available. If anyone subscribes to it, they get the latest values that have come out, right? So if you wanna, if, and unlike a promise, excuse me, unlike a callback, if you miss in a callback, if you miss listening for the, the when the event happens, you've missed the data. But in a stream like this, it, it, sh it remembers the last value that was emitted. And if you listen to one of these streams later, after it was originally emitted, you just get the latest value, the most recent value that came out. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. It's so now look, story. and so here's a code representation of that same visual API that we have above. Notice I have strong typing here, so I'm, I'm saying what type of observable it is. Notice I have methods here, and I should have said void here, right? So Mike, smack my hand. I'll leave and, it on the repo. Okay, yeah, do that. And then notice now, now we're getting into something else. So not only does a facade manage streams, but a good facade manages state. And in this case, because I don't want to use NGRX, but I want to use all the power that, that is the reasons why Redux is so powerful. So why is Redux powerful? Because it manages this idea of immutable data. And if you get a whole new data model every time anything changes inside of it, then you could just say equals, 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 and you know if it's different, and then you re-render. It's super fast, right? You don't have to do deep comparisons. This was the problem in AngularJS material, or AngularJS. So now I have some raw data that I'm made. Notice it's in my facade. 
this is in um, I, here. It's in the in the facade module, but it's a private variable, right? So now, and notice, oh, I'm I'm using a behavior subject here. So now I'm going to say, okay, that means um, that I can actually do the following. Uh, Sorry. Shut up, you guys. Thomas is talking. This is my favorite part. I'm really sorry. No worries. And so, I have to tell you, Thomas, these two lines of code right here that you have, mm -hmm. I have taught this to so many other people since you taught me, and they get so excited. So anybody watching, this right here, you need to remember this because it's beautiful, and I use it all the time. It's so when beautiful. I, I, actually, Bonnie, I use these names for a specific reason. I use store and state because... This should, for those who are familiar with NGRX, this looks eerily similar, but without all those extra files and all that extra power. And so this is a, and beautiful and easy, and it does the same thing. I mean, not not all the same thing. Obviously, it doesn't have, but it's so beautiful. It it does. Uh, it emulates NGRX in in a simple way. NGRX has more power. Uh, a lot more features, but in this case, we don't want that just yet, right? However, I use the name store because in NGRX, you're injecting a store service. So here I have one, and a store has this idea of actions, or excuse me, and also state. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the store that can actually emit new state out through the state stream. This is the, the state. So anytime any of this changes, those changes will be emitted out through this one stream. Why is your state private? Your state isn't your state public. You're getting ahead. I got to show you why. Sure. So good question. I like it. Did, did I? Here's my two dollars that I owe you, Bonnie. <laughs> okay. So let's go. Let's take a look at the actual code. All right. So here, let's go to our facade, and you're going to see this much better now. I'm so okay? excited. Okay. So here is my now. Look why. Now you'll see why. So state is private because. I'm just using it as the source stream, the upstream, to then extract the data out that I want for the streams that will be delivered out publicly. These are the public streams built on an upstream. This is the downstream built on an upstream. So notice this pipe just extracts. This is, if you guys are familiar with NGRX, this is a selector, right? This just extracts a portion of the data out that we want to use. Now look at this. Now it's pretty cool. Uh, uh, we're going to come back to this part a little bit later. But Don't. Then there's not even a function. Like, how do we get that? You'll see. All right. All right. So notice you're you're actually wondering. So this is the streams. So anytime state changes, these will fire. Okay, that's cool. In fact, in this case, because I'm using distinct until changed, I'm saying only when users, the array users is a new array, do I want to emit that new array out on the user stream. Only when the criteria it changes, the, the actual object for criteria, I don't care if pagination changes here, down here, I'm only interested in criteria. So if, if pagination changes, this stream does not emit a new value. That's pretty powerful, right? That's this is a little bit analogous to what we do you do with selectors and NGRX. Now here's the cool thing. So now I have my service and I'm saying I'm gonna combine, I'm gonna listen. I'm I'm actually listening internally. Um what I want to do is I need to do something. Bear with me, okay? We're here. Uh, we're running out of time, but I want to do this. It's worth every minute. Just give him another minute, Justin. Um, Bonnie's going to sing some hold music for you. Dun, dun, dun. I told y'all he was cool. You're okay. He's like, okay, Bonnie. Okay, here we go. All right, so notice on our facade, we have three public properties, these streams, criteria, pagination, and users. And we have this internal data, criteria, pagination, and users, all managed in an object called state. But notice internally, I'm using the same public streams and I'm watching them for their values. And when any of those change, I use them internally to make a call to find all users, which then updates users, which then outputs a new user list. So my streams are being used outside by views and they're being used inside to actually auto refresh and auto load users. 
to re-push the values to... To re-push the values. So if the pagination values change at all, or the criteria values change at all, then I automatically... Now let's go back to the code to show you that. Oops, wrong one. Um, here. Okay, so... I'm watching the YouTube and not one single person has dropped off, so... So <laughs> I guess that's good. All right, so notice we're watching these two streams and that's how you watch streams as you do, you say combine with latest. So if any of these values change, now I have the new structures. Okay, now I'm gonna make a call to the saying find all users, which gives me a stream back with this new values here. And I switch off of that and, and basically I'm not gonna just go into switch map, which is another powerful thing. And then I say, okay, now I have users. When I get the users, what do I do? I turn around and I update my state again with the new users, but I update the entire state object, this guy right here. The I update the entire thing, which then refires all my streams, right? But out of this, can you guys tell me which stream is actually going to emit? Users. No. Users. Only users will emit because only users was a new, look down here. Update um, right here. I only updated users. Oh, sorry, loading will emit too because I changed loading to false. All right. Now I have public methods and look what these guys do. They All they do is update the state object. So I didn't have to worry about calling manually the find all users again. I update the state object and then this hidden code here automatically loads it. So let's take a look at the UI for a second and show how that works. This is the best part. Are you wait? No, you're going to show us the component, right? Or the browser? The, the component before we run out of time. Don't forget because that's the best. That's when the first time I ever saw this. Oh, no. part, that's when I really freaked out. Well, and I don't want to show this part yet. Don't forget to show us the best part. I will. I don't want to show that just yet. Hang on. I want to show the live version. So okay. so here it is. So here is my live version. Notice it automatically loaded the data because I had an initial set of search criteria. If I change this, it automatically it's reloading. If I change this, and in fact, notice it went gray. It went gray because the loading flag, is, which was another stream, the loading flag says, hey, I'm loading. And then it went to true and then it went to false. And I have my UI that says, okay, if the loading stream says it's true, I'm gonna dim things out. So it just works really, really smoothly. So by using reactive pushed base facades, um, my views change. Now there's one important last thing, and this is the thing, Shorty, I wanted to tell everyone. So, because, and, and I discovered this recently with the help of um, Deborah Karata. She presented this idea at uh, NGConf, and I think she might've heard it from S Sandra Elias. But it's this really important thing here. I don't know, Bonnie, if you've seen this, what if no, I love Deborah and Saunders? So whatever it is, I want to know. What one of the biggest problems when you have stuff in views is if you let's say you had four streams, that means I might have four async pipes, right? Yeah. And that means you got lots of async pipes in your view template, and that's sort of problematic. Well, what if you could make it super simple and just say, if my view model is ready, then I'm going to re-render everything, and there's only one stream. So if I come over to my user facade. I can come down and I can say my view model, I'm going to combine the pagination stream, the criteria stream and the user stream and the loading stream. I'm going to combine them all. And when any of those change, I'm going to return and emit a new object with all the raw values. And now my view template just has one async pipe and it works super slick. And it, the views don't need to worry about how the, all this data was refreshed. It's beautiful. Right, so notice in my facade, uh, let's close this so you can see some. Notice in the facade, all this complexity is hidden inside. We certainly would not want this nonsense in the view component. But the advantage of putting it here is it's completely testable without any UI. You can thrash test the hell out of this. <laughs> and I had to use the hell word again. <laughs> and then um, notice here, I just said, okay, my view model is a stream and a facade, give me the current view model that I, and I could have constructed the view model here. I decided I didn't want to because it's so easy to hide that detail. And notice here, um, this right here is just, uh, so what this is doing is it's saying, the I want, when I start my application up here, watch this. 
I want to populate my UI with the current values that's in my data model. So I actually have to listen for the criteria stream, and I take one value, the current value, and I extract that value out, and then I patch it. That's how I get this here. Yeah, but that's so you're so in ng on init you're waiting for your UI, right? But all of the data is just line 18. Like that's it. All my data is here. Um, and in fact, I could have done well, what this one's doing is saying I could have actually well here, I could have done this. I could have said um, VM dollar. Here's another subscribe, but I'm taking one. And now I want to only care about the criteria. Oops, I gotta do this wrap it here. So this is called destructuring in TypeScript. And now the same thing, I'm listening for the view model, but I'm only care about the criteria and I'm grabbing it once and I'm disconnecting after that. Take one means disconnect after I get the initial value. Because Bonnie, after that, actually, you know what, Bonnie? What? Um, no, I have. I need to do it this way because I'm, I'm doing a patch value on a form control. Right. But right, I, I don't want to... the reason why you need that code is because of your interface. But I mean, really, for uh, for just for loading the initial values, really is line. And this is why I love the the little behavior subject that you had in the facade is just so simple that all you need. Because when the first time you showed this to me, it blew my mind. I'm like, what? Don't I need to call a function to get my data? And you were like, no, just literally call the stream right there. Like you're you're taking that. And then you just have that one line. And I didn't know that you could even do that. Yeah, I this is to call a function. And you were like, no, just this equals this straight from the facade. It blew my mind. I was like, well, whoa. This is what I meant by long lived permanent streams, right? This stream's always available to anyone who wants to listen on it. And um, it remembers the last admitted value. So anyone coming later to the game can listen, get the most recent value com that's come out. And it only emits when the data that it's interested in specifically changes. And everything and else. Clarify because this is something that I have found a lot of people confused about because, and I just explained this to someone yesterday again, this, you, so you're taking your observable stream and you're using a pipe and you're not subscribing at all. You're going no. to go ahead and do that. So every time, because people say, and, and I said, it. remember a long time ago, Thomas, when I was like, I have to subscribe because I have to modify my values. And that's the only way I know to get them. You don't have to subscribe. You can pipe an active stream and then leave it alone. And that pipe will be there when someone else comes and gets it. Well, the and I, great that's an important thing that a lot of people don't understand, I think. I didn't understand it for a while. The great thing about observables is every time you use an operator, this map or anything else, it internally subscribes to the outer observable and it returns a new observable inside so this stream never changes but when the pipe come, uh, is done you get a totally new observable stream and that's assigned to here and now that i've constructed this stream like the, the operators they could transform values they could block values they could extract values they could do all sorts of things whatever you want the beauty of this, though, approach is that the user facade hides all those details. Like the views do not have to know where this data is coming from. And if you have to wait for a user to click one drop down before you can load the values for the next drop down, you can still you do this. That's right. There's. That's right. I think, um, Shorty, that is all I wanted to show. We could stop screen sharing now if you'd like. Oh, hold, hold on, I wanted to go back over one thing. Can you get sure. the code in the second tab there? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, but so, now it's not Thomas's fault anymore. It's yeah. Mike's fault. <laughs> That's fine. So I have two things to say. One, I don't think it's gonna be very controversial. I think it's just helpful. And the other one um, is debatable. Uh, so the first one is the one thing that I really like about this pattern is that where you have those observables defined on 53 to 56 users mm -hmm. uh, dollar sign, all of those, you can start off and start working on your component by just using of as a way of creating an observable. And you don't need to link it up to a backend or anything else. You could simply start by just providing an, an observable there. The problem with providing an observable of of is it's static. Okay, no. I, I agree, but it's it really off point and yeah, you potentially yeah. have multiple people working on this where somebody's working on the component and somebody else is working on the Correct. Theory. That's um, correct. And it, it gets you to be able to start uh, your development because maybe your backend service or whoever is working on that may not be ready at that point. It's a little bit way to provide the same API because then you don't have to change your component later on. 
and you can um, just get started quicker. That is such an important point, really, um, because it because it protects you. If your API changes, which you know it will eventually, this is protecting you from refactoring your whole view every time the API changes, especially if you're pulling in uh, third-party libraries. Yeah. yeah. The other thing you can do is mock it. So then in test scenarios or storybook or any other type of isolated development, you could mock that and you have that API signature. So it's really easy to get test data going as well. Very true. Mm -hmm. um, it fits into a talk that I actually want to put together of how like the mindset and the workflow to develop components. Um, I love that talk. <laughs> uh, the other one is, is a little bit more controversial is on line 61. You're defining the view model here. To me, that would be a concern of the component, and I would want to define that in the component while leaving the facade to just expose the four other observables and True. the specific view, view define or worry about combining that for how it's going to be pre presented for the template. So I thought, and in fact, you have a very good point, and it's very true. However, if you do that, then all this code, let's just quickly do something, okay? Mm -hmm. You put it in here. All uh, it would become like um, something like this dot facade dot pagination, and this dot facade, Correct. and then you have to import all the operators. So let me just copy this here, like this here and here. Then I have to import these two operators, and I have to know about. So then I have to come up here, put this up here, like that. And then I have to take this operator here as a, uh, uh, as an operator. So this is not an operator. This is a const uh, a, cons a creator function. Correct. And here is an operator. Now you have to do that. Now it would work, right? Obviously it worked. But the problem is this this is one of those Mike where I debated like, okay, this still feels like my view got too complicated. To me, if I wanted to have a separate component utilizing just the users, right? I could oh, potentially use that same service in that component where I don't necessarily care about the pagination mm -hmm. or uh, the loading indicator or the other um, values there. So I, to me, that seems more tightly coupled to the component of saying, hey, I know that you're exposing all this great data and I just want to happen to combine it for my particular view. Mm -hmm. But for Thomas's pattern, you can just take the user. And not the whole rest of it. Yeah, you could you could also do this if you wanted to say users dollar is equal to this dot facade dot users dollar. You could do that. that was Mike? Like I said, it was debatable, and there's a lot of opinion based mm -hmm. off of that one. Like arguing I know, I the same thing. <laughs> this this is a great thing about coding, right? There is no absolute correct approach. Sometimes it's a matter of style and subjective opinion. And uh, but I think the, the conclusion to, to this talk, though, is that push-based uh, facade, um, push-based facades, are really, really important to, to changing the way you approach developing Angular applications, and it will make your application um, uh, life more fun and more productive. You make life more fun and productive, Thomas. <laughs> no, Bonnie, I'd have to give you the, the capital A for that one. Oops. Um, how do I stop sharing, guys? Okay, well, I got it. Stop presenting. Now you, okay, there you go. You got it. You will be continuously presenting for all time, and Forever. everybody will just watch you code so, from okay. here to the end of time. Well, thanks for letting me yak um, your ear off, everyone. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, let's get into some picks real quick before we uh, put a button, button on this. So anybody have any picks? I have two picks. Okay. Uh, one of them is Angular Rome. Tickets are on sale right now. If you use the code Bonnie NG Rome, you get a discount. And the second pick, um, actually, I think Thomas could tell us about uh, Narwhal Connect is like live. You guys can start using it. It's up and running. Thomas, you know, you know those Narwhal guys, right? You know what? I I continue to be impressed with them so much. Uh, Jason is working on the NX um, schematic set. You've got uh, Victor, who's leading the whole crew. Jeff, who's managing the business in, in an amazing way. They have they only have Connect. They have so they have um, console uh, NX .dev, I believe is the URL. And let me make sure I've said it right. And there's another one NX. Yeah, if you, everyone goes to NX .dev, you'll see, and there's a little button in the upper right called training. Uh, Jeff, uh, Shorty, can you share the screen again? I want to show something real quick. 
Sorry, Justin, that was my fault. Last All one, right. it was my fault. All right, I'm sharing, but so whenever you're ready to share. Uh, how do I do that? I go here, I say um, share. Let's do this. Let's go here. Can you see my screen? My screen? Yep. All right, so notice if I do a login here. So this is the, the training part, right? So I'm going to connect here. This is the coolest thing. They have a cool a cookbook of like little things that you should think about, like how to create a basal remote cache, how to debug expression change after checked, um, how to load critical CSS, how to migrate from Karma to Jest. This stuff is all free and it's all available for the community. This is amazing. Thanks, Jeff. I'll stop sharing now. Awesome. Cool. All right, Mike, got any picks? I do. I have three. Uh, first of all, uh, the Canary build of Microsoft Edge, the web browser, is available for Mac. So you can use the Edge browser, you use, which utilizes the Chromium engine underneath for Mac now if you want to go out and download that for Mac. Uh, that's pick one. The other two are both YouTube videos. One is A for A is for Angular by Joanna Pierce from NGConf. And it's just a, it's a five minute talk and it is phenomenal. Excellent delivery, excellent content, good laugh. I've probably watched it five or six times since the conference. It's definitely uh, worth checking out. And the other one uh, is a little bit of a how to. That's three. I said I had three, but two videos. <laughs> and the last one is. Uh, <laughs> Stephen Fluin, who was on the show last week, uh, came out with a how-to <coughs> video to set up Angular and Nest. Uh, so definitely go and check that out. That's on YouTube as well. Those are awesome. The Angular console allows you to create a Nest um, uh, application also within a workspace. Very cool. Awesome. Should I give some picks, Shorty? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, two, two quick ones. Stop sharing your screen so that we can see. Oh, how face. do I stop sharing? I'm an uh, idiot. Uh, Button at the bottom or something. Yeah, there you go. All right. All right. Okay. What are your picks? Sorry, man. Uh, my picks, uh, Nest.js. Re so I've, if you're not leveling up learning RxJS, then you're missing out. The other two things that I think we should really be paying attention to is Nest.js, amazing, and Stencil from the Ionic framework. Really, really provocative technology. Awesome. Awesome. All right, man. Well, Thanks a ton for sharing your time, Thomas, coming on, talking about this stuff, educating everybody. Uh, so very appreciative that you came back on and, and did this. So thank you. Of course. Thank you for having me. I, I will have a blog coming out in a couple days, have all the links, the stack blitz is everything. So just check it out on Medium. But thank you for letting me talk about it. Awesome. Okay. We're going to have to bring another, another show, get you back on here, uh, maybe more of this topic or something else for sure in the future. And well, I want to do some training with you, Shorty. You know, we, we need, need to do, do that another... too. We need to do okay. that too. That's that's a blast. I love but it. for the for everyone that's hearing this, I meant that Shorty and I are co-trainers training a work presenting at a workshop. Where? When? Uh, we do the it's called Angular Enterprise for part of Narwhal. It's for client uh, private client engagements, but it is the best training that I'm aware of. We deep dive in, and blow people's brains out. Right, uh, with oh, RxJS oh, and NGRX. Thomas, that's a felony. Okay. Uh, hey, <laughs> I want everybody to know that all four of us will be at Angular Denver, and you can you can still get tickets for Angular Denver in the first week in August. And Thomas will be there. Shorty and Mike will be there. I will be there. We'll all be there. Go get tickets for Angular Denver and come hang out with us. Awesome. One final pick, right? <laughs> Sorry, I can't. All right, it. cool. No worries, no worries. All right, that's a wrap. Thank you, Shorty. Yeah, thanks. You guys rock. See you. Have a good one, everyone. Bye bye. See ya.